Hello America, this is Call of Duty Goddess. Today is May the 8th, 2017. I was looking at the war map and I noticed when this war map for Ukraine here that we have a couple destroy well actually we just have one destroyer but two pictures of it going into the Black Sea. Here we have a destroyer it's the USS Oscar Austin. It's a DDG-79 Arleigh Burke class destroyer. The Oscar Austin entered the Black Sea on the 5th, a couple days ago. It's a guided missile destroyer and it's there to conduct maritime security operations and enhance capability and interoperability with allies and partners in the region. And there's a quote from Commander Janice Smith, the commanding officer of the USS Oscar Austin. She says that we're building strong relationships here, which are crucial to peace and stability in the region. Our presence here bolsters confidence and reassures allies of our commitment to security in the Black Sea. Now, before we get into this map, I think it's important to understand the Russian sentiment on our destroyers. And we're going to start with this 2002 article from the Arms Control Association. The U.S. withdrawals from ABM Treaty, Global Response, is muted. Signed in 1972 by Washington and Moscow to slow the nuclear arms race, the ABM treaty barred both superpowers from deploying national defenses against long-range ballistic missiles and from building the foundation for such a defense. The treaty was based on the premise that if either superpower constructed a strategic defense, the other would build up its offensive nuclear forces to offset the defense. The superpowers would therefore quickly be put on a path toward a never-ending offensive defensive arms race as each tried to balance its counterparts actions. The treaty did however allow both sides to build defenses against short and medium range ballistic missiles. So now that we understand that let's move on to the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum of 2016 and this is where Putin is talking about this defense system, the treaty, and the impending danger of the nuclear arms race. He basically informed them that he knew that America, in particular the Obama administration, announced plans for a one trillion dollar nuclear weapons plan, which pretty much was targeted at Russia. He speaks of that as well. He goes on to claim that he tried to make deals with America to curb the production of weaponry but America refused to cooperate. He then goes on to state that the U.S. placed the missile defense system in Romania. He also said that how does he know whether it's nuclear or not? It can be changed very easily. He talks about how America said that Iran was a nuclear threat and that's the reason that we do what we do. He said that that was a lie because now that the Obama administration made the Iran nuclear deal that we should feel safe from it, that he was happy with the Iran nuclear deal. He goes on to talk about the anti-missile system that are sea-based. He explains that these anti-missile systems are not just anti-missile systems that they are offensive systems as well as defensive systems. He ends up saying it was a blessing rooted in a mutual threat, but this mutual threat is what guaranteed mutual peace on a global scale. I think this is gravely dangerous. I not only think that, I'm assured of it. So this grave warning last year that came from Putin is actually a big sign and I'll of course leave the links below for everything and I want you to keep in mind that Putin makes it a point that America is the aggressor on this and America will not cooperate with Russia and although Putin insists that America has been the aggressor the whole time, he is the one who's taken the land in Georgia and the Crimean Peninsula. Now, we learned in this video here how important 
the Bosporus Strait is for the Black Sea. We also learned that if you have a nation that is set on the Black Sea, that that Montreux Agreement with Turkey does not apply to you because you basically are part owner of the Black Sea and you can go in and out as you please. That is significant to what's going on. Now there are serious geopolitical implications with this that are economical as well as militarily strategic. Both very, very important. And we'll go to Google Earth here and check out the importance of the Black Sea to Russia. We'll start off with it being a virtual fortress. It's really actually amazing. Uh, it's just naturally surrounded by mountains. Look at all of the mountains. Mountain ranges everywhere. And you have right here Turkey. Could you imagine if Erdogan dropped out of NATO and teamed up with Putin? Could you imagine that? That would be pretty wild. It would be pretty rough for Central Europe as well. Really rough. Especially because they get the majority of their oil from here. Okay? They're hoping, I guess, that's going to change with the um, major discovery of oil in the Golan Heights. Is that, uh, yeah, I think that's right there, West Bank. And we may as well talk about the oil here that's right up here. Comes down through all kinds of, you know, watersheds, rivers, down through here. Had some ships marked, yes. Give you an idea of um, the shipping here. There's a ship there and there. So they are busy with plenty of shipping in this area here. Goes to the uh, Sea of Azov. Then it goes right into the Black Sea. And as you can see, Crimea is of utmost importance. And speaking of the Crimea, amazing that Stalin in the 1940s, early to mid 1940s, ethnically cleansed Crimea of all populations except for Russians. And as you can imagine, just by looking at the map here, Ukraine is in the midway point between uh, Russia and Europe. So I'm sure that a lot of European people migrated to the Ukraine and went down to Crimea for fishing and stuff like that. So it was ethnically cleansed in the 1940s. You have to wonder, was there a reason for that? Did he know something, maybe a plan perhaps that was hatched a very, very long time ago. Now it sounds crazy, I know, but when you look at history as a whole, especially the wars and things like that, you start to see a pattern here. For instance, in November of 2015, Ukraine's parliament recognized the 1944 genocide of the Crimean Tatars. What happened was the mass deportations of Crimean Tatars in 1944. Now these Tatars were primarily Muslim. Amazingly enough, in the Muslim Brotherhood in America and what's behind it part two, I talk about this and actually before the ethnic cleansing there was Operation Barbosa. So let's hear a little bit about that. Bana became a devotee of Adolf Hitler who was himself an admirer of Islam and militarist jihad conquest. What is not well known is that the spread of the Muslim Brotherhood to the West was facilitated by the CIA during the Cold War era as a part of an anti-Soviet, anti-communism initiative during the Truman and Eisenhower administration. The creation of an Islamic center in Munich involved an ex-Nazi Turkologist 
and former Nazi Muslim veterans from the Soviet Muslim satellites, which were captured by advancing German forces during World War II in the Caucasus and Crimea. The CIA funded Hassan al-Banna's son-in-law to advance the Muslim Brotherhood cause via the World Muslim League. This resulted in a Muslim Brotherhood beachhead in the U.S. launched from the Munich Islamic Center. Gerhard von Mend, who was an ex-Nazi Turkologist and ethnic German born in Riga, Latvia, held a Ph.D. in Soviet Studies and Economics from Berlin University and ultimately became a full professor there. Von Men was a talented linguist, spoke Turkish, and spoke several Central Asian variants, Arabic, Russian, French, English, and even Norwegian. Pre-war books by Von Men predicted the rise of independent Muslim states if a severe shock to the Soviet Union occurred, either by invasion, akin to a failed German attack during World War II, or what occurred in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Empire and its breakup in 1991, when Nazi Germany launched Operation Barbosa, the invasion of Soviet Russia in June 1941, von Men was put in charge of the Hitler-era Ostministerium which was the bureaucracy for administering the occupied territories in the East, where he developed plans for harnessing Islam, a strategy that will last long after the Nazi defeat. Von Men was a very willing and effective tool in Hitler's Third Reich goals. In the initial Nazi invasion of Russia, hundreds of thousands of Soviet Muslim soldiers were captured. These Muslim Soviet POWs were initially maltreated. A German officer and Uzbek expat living in Germany, Veli Kayyem, entered the camps and enlisted their aid in forming fighting military units to combat their former Soviet masters. Kayyem ultimately becomes head of Turkestan National Liberation Council. Another Uzbek and von Men protege, Basmira Hyatt, became liaison to the German high command. Several hundred thousand former Soviet Muslim POWs joined this effort and formed Waffen SS units akin to those in the Balkans, like the Bosnian and Dagger Division. One such Caucasian unit had regular German uniforms with a distinctive patch. These Soviet Muslim cadres and German units were used in the unsuccessful relief of Stalingrad. Other former Soviet Muslim POWs became functionaries at the Ostministrum in Berlin and were organized into national liberation desks, engaged in propaganda broadcasts, a model for post-World War II CIA-funded efforts at Radio Liberty. One of those who figures into post-World War II activities with the CIA-funded Radio Liberty is Tatar Garup Salton who held the Tatar Liberation Desk at the Nazi Ostministerium. Sultan was promoted to military governor of the Tatar Provisional Government by the Nazis. After working for von Men, he was recruited by the CIA and went to Mecca for the Hajj. He made the trip to Mecca in order to counter Soviet propaganda there. One of von Men's initiatives bore significant results when over 20,000 Tatars joined Waffen SS auxiliaries after the Nazis took the Crimea. Von Men reached out to the Grand Mufti Haj Amin Alusini and asked him to consider taking the post of Mufti for the conquered Crimea. At the end of World War II, with the collapse of the Nazi Eastern Front, von Men made arrangements with British for the Muslim units to be transferred to the Western Front so as to fall into the hands of the British and the Americans, with whom they fought against in that very same war. The British and Americans seem to be interested in this Osministrum network because of the anti-Soviet immigrants. Some Muslim units interviewed by U.S. Army CIC evade a return to ultimate imprisonment and death in a Soviet gulag under the terms of the Yalta Agreement. Upwards of a few thousand of these ex-Nazi Muslim soldiers ended up in displaced persons camps near Munich, 
the largest city in the American sector of post-war Germany. Under President Truman, which was a member of the secret society called the Ancient Arabic Order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, or Shriners, the CIA was created with the National Security Act of 1947. Along with the next president to take office, President Eisenhower, was the beginning of serious efforts to combat the influence and expansion of the Soviet Union around the world. They also saw use for the Muslim minorities in West Germany. Psychological warfare was a highly popular tool with the new agencies and with Eisenhower. Now, what you just heard there was based on a book titled A Mosque in Munich. Nazis, the CIA, and the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, and it was written by Ian Johnson. In case you're wondering, he does give source information. Just saying. In that video, I give the source as well, but I give it in a way that you can read it if you don't purchase the book. Here we go, how the CIA helped the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrate the West, Nazi CIA and the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, there are quite a few book reports that were done on it in 2010 when it came out. It, it was a big deal, actually. And when you look at the Islamic invasion that's going on now, ISIS and even the CIA, with the CIA's first assets actually being Tatar Muslims, you start to put things together. And you have to ask yourself if this was a plan. And I don't believe for one second that Russia is innocent in this. I believe that Russia has just as much to do with this as we do, possibly more. So there's your war map update. And bottom line, Russia is not innocent in this. I believe it's a New World Order thing. This is Call of Duty Goddess signing off, and as always, I've got your six.